teaching and practice and uh, the seminar is about trying to get an overview and an up-to-date grasp of the situation, trying to find uh, operational ways to entangle and uh, get a grip of this uh, very wicked problem of teaching and practice and what it has to do with the future architects. And during the day I put a few notes down on this computer and uh, I've also found a few illustrations from uh, previous lectures I've given on this topic we are discussing today at this symposium. And what have we learned today? What kind of new knowledge might Luciano Lassari bring home today, to quote from his introduction? And maybe the most important uh, thing he should uh, bring home is that this symposium may somehow be seen as a proof that the formalized and informal cooperation between education and practice does work, even on a European scale, which is important. Schools and practice should cooperate. The ACEA working party was an extremely good idea with a lot of potential. And if I was to decide, this has been the first of a series of maybe biannual European conferences on the relationship between education and uh, practice. Uh, there are certain, you know, before I got to, knew, to know ACE through cooperation, I knew ACE through their statistics, which, is, uh, which is, was a fantastic tool to try to understand European architecture in some way. And, I might be wrong, but uh, we've had a little colloquium over here, and it seems from your statistics that only two percent of the European architects, of two percent of architects, European architects, work abroad, and the second number is that two thirds of European architects are working alone in a way. So we're talking about a situation where there's sort of a little sort of differences between our discussions of, of, of the future of architecture and the, 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 the existing and the, the existing situations in a way. Uh, a few I'd like to give a few comments to the, the different sessions in a way. Uh, this might be, have been true at some point of time, uh, hopefully not true anymore. Uh, in the first session about uh, integrated strategies, integrated strategies, we met uh, four speakers. Uh, Matteo Rubigio from uh, the Politecnico in Torino, you know, he stated, as I heard him, that there is a new global order in a way. There's a new, there's a totally new situation and we have to adapt to this situation. But then we had three different interventions afterwards, which uh, I think were extremely interesting also because they came from, uh, from very, you know, they, they came from very different viewpoints. First, Johan de Walsh. Uh, we talked about the relationship between practice, education, and research, and he introduced the two terms over academization and under academization. Very difficult words for a Norwegian to say in English, but uh, as you heard, I tried. Uh, and he stated the need for reflection and argument in architecture. You know, and, and I think this is a very this is a very important statement, you know, because even I know that there's a new situation. You can't only deliver your drawing. You have to put up an argument for what you're doing, in a way. And you have to give some kind of decent, you have to, you have to, you have to present some kind of decent argumentation for every architectural concept. So his conclusion, in a way, was that there is the, the res, the res, there is an argument for research. Research is a very sort of relevant part of uh, architectural education and architectural practice today. And then Catherine 
Jaco came along. And of course, many of us have been very impressed with the way the French government treats architecture in the recent years, especially how they developed the, the, the French cities on a municipal level. And of course, it's, it's rather impressive how they sort of uh, uh, launch a national cultural in initiative, both to, to change architectural education and architectural practice, and also to stimulate this change to sort of economic means. And then, you know, it's my favorite of the day, Jane Duncan from RIBA. Uh, we followed, you know, these, all these experiments in, in uh, English uh, architectural education for a few years, and they sort of, they're, they are entertaining, they are, they are sort of bold, and they are terribly frightening in a way. And, and of course, but I think, I think it's, it's, a, it's a very strange situation because it's, uh, of course, uh, this island is a very strange island as we have learned to know, you know, excessively during the, the last years. And, and you know, the, the English educational system is also a very special branch in a way. And then they go into the question of costs and they, they bring up a discussion about, you know, education and, and, uh, and practice in relation to the question of cost, which is, which is of course, very relevant, but, which, but which, which is, of course, an, also an extreme, in a way, illustration of the power of the English class system, in a way. You know, it's a very, it's a very dangerous thing. And we'll see what comes out of it. But uh, but I'm 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 not I'm I'm extremely positive. You know, we've invited people from England all the time to talk about these new experiments related to the relationship between the profession and education. You know, uh, the, you know the 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 strongest statements coming from uh, English professionals are in a, is in a way that you know why do we need academia? You know, why can't we do it the old way? To bring the young people into our offices, and you know, they leave the offices after 10 years and they are good architects, you know. Bringing the Corbusier architect, uh, argument into the, into the whole thing. But I, 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 this is, I, find, I find it extremely interesting. And maybe, you know, the, the first results of these English experiments could be the topic of our next, of our next conference. It's a very, very interesting thing. Uh, then uh, the whole question about uh, the regulation of the profession. I think this is, of course, this is a very valid discussion, important discussion, and it's a discussion that brings up quite a lot of temperature always because there are sort of different national standpoints in relation to this. We want four plus two, we want, uh, we want two years in uh, practice before you can enter the dis discipline, etc. There's, there's a lot of sort of uh, heat in the discussion around it. But uh, to make it very short, I, and I've done this before, I'll do it once again, and this is to say that there are two words or two concepts that are more important than any other things in relation to the quality of architectural education. And the first thing, of course, is the quality of the teacher. A good teacher can teach architecture anywhere within any curriculum. That will be the way I see it. And the second word is just as important and should be taken more into the cons into the consideration in many countries, and it's the quality of the educational environment. What kind of educational environment do you create for your students? And there's a lot of lot there's a lot of things to do here. Because in quite a lot of European countries, universities are, you know, something happened in 1968 and then nothing has happened afterwards, you know, to put it very short. It's a very conservative field with a lot of potential for improvement. Then I have to run a little here because then the whole uh, discussion of the global architect. Which is an interesting one, of course, and uh, and uh, of course they, you know, they could have continued until 12 o'clock tonight. It was a very nice uh, discussion, and uh, of course, 
Roger Reeve demonstrates, you know, a lot of what you can call contextual smartness was the word we used on the, at the end when we talked about what you're talking about, you know, the, the, the ability to adapt and to, to use uh, the positive parts of a specific situation in your projects. And then, you know, I get very afraid when you show your infrastructural projects in Africa and I come up, come up with the old questions. Where are the street vendors? You know, all the street vendors, they are, they are not in the perspective. Is this Africa or is it, is it grass or is it somewhere else? You know? And it demonstrates the difficulty in my, in my view to adapt to a, a local situation. And then our Japanese guest from Nikki and Seiki comes along. ICT is, uh, does it mean uh, intelligent computer technology? Is that, is that what it means, ICT? Yeah, I guess it's intelligent computer technology. And of course, he, this is uh, Internet communication technology, then we got it correct. And of course, it's, uh, it's extremely interesting. And it's some kind of brave new world. And it's, it's in a way shows what you should be able to master if you're entering this sort of uh, a certain international market, competitive international market. You have to, and you have to be able to, to master these things. Also, the European offices have to be able to master these things, and things are going extremely quickly. But of course, it's a, this is it's very difficult. This question of the global architect, because because if I show you three pictures, this is there are one and a half million Chinese villages. You know, it's uh, incredible. One and a half million Chinese villages. Many of them are being torn down. And what kind of knowledge do you need to interfere in a situation like this? Or let's take the next one. This is uh, the lucky summer. You know, a lot of housing, new housing, mid-class housing in, uh, in, uh, in Nairobi, Kenya. And this is a small village on the North Atlantic coast. Uh, and then I raise the question, you know, uh, what about local knowledge? You know, what about local knowledge? Uh, what's about, what about the needs in local knowledge? And then we know there's a lot of beautiful small cities and settlements, well-functioning in the Alps, you know, everywhere, well-functioning settlements. And they used to have an architect, like they used to have a dentist that knew the teeth of everyone in the village, in a way, and did his practice locally. And then, this is my hero. Maybe it's nostalgia, but he's my hero. She's my hero. The, the, the architect that is able to sort of develop a practice based on local knowledge, in a way. Might be global in the head, might, but, but in a way, is the practice is based on a profound understanding of local circumstances and local politics and local culture, etc. You know, maybe, I don't know, this is some kind of a dream, you know, maybe architects should be looked upon as dentists, you know, every village needs one. And it's, you know, probably they should be willing to pay for one as well. So it's something here, you know, of course, you know, there's a complexity to this problem. But there's something I think we need to bring in the question of the local architect and the question of local knowledge into the discussion to make it more complete, to put it this way. And this incredible number about the how many European architects work alone is an argument for bringing in the question of, of local knowledge to my, the way I look upon it. Let's see where I am. Yeah, I'm there. Talking a little about the schools in the end. This is, uh, this is not from the discussion, this is an addition to the discussion. But uh, the EAA has been working for uh, three or four years about uh, trying to get an understanding of what is happening in uh, European schools of architecture, you know, what is, what is really happening uh, at the moment. And of course, there, uh, there, uh, you know, education has been threatened, you know, less money, uh, pressure on curriculum, 
difficulties in funding, etc. And there, there's, there's been a uncertain, developed some kind of uncertainty in the situation. And this uncertainty, of course, has been troublesome, but it's also been fruitful because the, 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 in a way, the, the schools are, are questioning what they are doing, in a way. Then everybody thinks, and we also thought, that this, uh, these changes and this uh, internationalization or globalization would lead to what you could call a global studio or a global curriculum, all the, which means that all the European schools were doing the same, but this, this did not happen, uh, as far as we know. What happened is there is a process of internationalization uh, every school is trying to develop their own traditions and quality, and there is a tendency to specialize, which is, which is very sort of clear. The, the schools try to specialize and uh, become different in a way. They're become, becoming different in a way. Then we, three years ago, tried to categorize, you know, these new schools into, into groups. Uh, and it's very, it's very, it's very rough. And it uh, maybe we'll do it in a different. We would have done it in a different way today. But this is what we did three years ago. Uh, we talked about uh, we talked about schools that did go for professionalism. You know, employability being the word. We are the schools that you know gives diplomas. All our students gets employment, and you do everything to sort of to to close up to that intention or that goal. Then some schools are going very much for a research orientation. Some of them have even quit their bachelor education, goes only for master education, goes for funding in research. Then, uh, and this is very normal, uh, there are schools that sort of, you stop educating architects as some kind of complete and comprehensive things, because you, you specialize, you can say, oh, we, our architects are in a way specialized in sustainable urban development, our architects are specialized in uh, property development, which is very normal, our architects are specialized in this and this and this and this, and uh, this is also, of course, it's, uh, I think it's, it gives the students more employability because it's, uh, you know, it feels very good with the employer. Oh, here we are. Here's a specialized. Spe he has specialization in uh, sustainable urban development. We have to bring him into our, of our office in a way. But of course, it's it's uh, it's a little threatening for the architect, the traditional architectural profession. And then there's a discussion about widening the field, and probably the Netherlands has has been the country that. Uh, sort of have gone very far in this, saying that today we need other kinds of architects, knowing other things. Probably, for instance, we, they need a deeper knowledge of, of, uh, of social sciences. They need, uh, they, need, they need a deeper knowledge of how to interfere in society, etc., etc., which also... And then there are... The last thing here is that, uh, of course, there are... There are schools that stick very much to the tradition and uh, try to continue to uh, develop architects, architecture as an artistic discipline, which is also sort of very normal. But you, you find you find a lot of different kinds of different kinds of ways to adapt to this new situation. So I think if you should if we should take make one conclusion of this. Uh, first seminar <laughs> in the biannual series of seminars on architecture and profession is that uh, I would, uh, and uh, the term conclusion was, uh, was mentioned here, and my conclusion would be that uh, there is no such thing as a new normal in architectural education, and there is probably no such thing as a new normal in architectural practice, you know. These things are changing very rap rapidly, and they will continue to change. And maybe already when we meet in two years, but at least when we meet in four years, 
our questions will be different. So we we sort of it's a it's a it's a it's a it's a situation that well develops very quickly both in the profession and the education. But I think the relationship between education and profession is more fruitful today than it than it has been for for decades. I would say. Thank you.